gospel reading for today comes to us from the gospel of John, uh, John chapter 18. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, But are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth, that everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon for this evening looks at John 18, beginning at the 33rd verse, as we continue our series on the witnesses to Christ. Now, how many out there are familiar with William Jefferson? Not Thomas Jefferson, you probably know him. So that how many are familiar with William Jefferson? See, William Jefferson was a congressman from the state of Louisiana. But in 2002, William Jefferson used the resources of an organization that was meant to encourage people to vote, indeed to ensure that his daughter would get a House seat in the Louisiana State House of Representatives. Is that in 1998, in 2002, and in 2006, is that William Jefferson used that same organization to ensure that his sister was elected to a city official position in the city of New Orleans. So that a few days after Hurricane Katrina came devastatingly through the area, is that William Jefferson used a National Guard detachment to go and retrieve some personal items for him from his house. And when that detachment got stuck in the mud in their truck, is that sure enough is that he helped divert a National Guard helicopter to go and help them. Is that in March 2005, a company named iGate is that sent William Jefferson $400,000 to ensure that with his help, that they would go ahead and make sure that they would get that business persuading the army to purchase iGate technology. The final straw came in August 2005, that when the FBI raided his home, they found $90,000 in cash in the freezer of his kitchen. Now, William Jefferson... Innocent or not so much? That guilty, very guilty in the midst of things, is that in 2007 he was indeed sentenced to 13 years in federal prison, the longest stretch for any congressman indeed convicted of bribery. Is that today as we step in to this very series of the witnesses to Christ, as we meet Barabbas, is that we come in the midst of that reality of innocent and guilty, that idea of we step right in to that midst of a trial. Is that who's innocent, who's guilty, and who is going to be set free? 
That as we step in, we all know that when we think about innocent, we know that Jesus is the very one who is there. That even Pilate sees it over and over again. Pilate begins to declare, I find no guilt in him. Is that Pilate, of all people, even saw in Jesus, not one who needed to be the one who would deserve the cross, maybe a lecture, maybe a lashing, maybe a good old-fashioned beating, but not the cross. That twice in this text of John is that he emphasized that that Pilate was the governor. That meant that he was the very one who sat on the ultimate judgment seat. That with Pilate uh, that with Pilate lay that very idea of life or death. That he was the only one who could decide on death penalty cases. And yet, even though Pilate declares him innocent, and he does, and does so again two more times in John chapter 19, that Jesus still finds himself in this predicament. So not only does Pilate continue to proclaim Jesus' innocence, but the entire New Testament again and again proclaims to us of just how innocent he is. It's not just that he was innocent of the charges or innocent of what they accused him of over and over that day, but that he was perfectly innocent. Hebrews 4.15 says that he was perfect without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he did not even know sin in the midst of his life. That when it came to Jesus, we know clearly where the very verdict falls. Innocent. Now what about Barabbas? As we step into this man that we get very little information about in the scriptures. Is that what do we hear but that very guilty verdict just hanging over his head? Just as guilty as William Jefferson, that his sins were far too known by all who gathered there that day. Is it Pontius Pilate poses that question, do you want me to release that king of the Jews? And what did we hear? Not this man, but give us Barabbas. That Barabbas, it says, was a robber. Now, there's something that we need to at least begin to wrestle with. What does that mean, that he was a robber? That that Greek word, leistes, is not just a robber, someone who steals things. That very word, leistes, is a marauding, violent outlaw who finances all of his lawless acts by the very things that he plunders and steals. That how do we know? That just look at the very use of the very same word of Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan. That as that man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, that he fell among robbers who stripped him, beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. So when we take this verse from John and see what it is that we see in that parable of the Good Samaritan, we know that this robber is the very worst kind of outlaw. A lace taste won't simply just rob from you, steal from you, take from you. A lace taste will rob you, kill you, and spit on your mother while he's at it. Is that this is that kind of situation? Then Mark 15 even tells us more, that among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. Insurrection? Not just a insurrection, but the insurrection. Among all of those murderers was this one known as Barabbas. 
facts that his very name was so well known, it's likely that Barabbas was one who was leading the very insurrection. Barabbas was probably part of that group all known as the Zealots. They had just simply one political talking point, out with Rome, and they were willing to slit any throat to make that very agenda happen. That Barabbas is one who isn't just a petty thief or a second-handed scoundrel. He's not one who's down there shoplifting candy at the local mall. Is that this is a man that the Roman government would not concern itself with a petty thief to take him to the cross. He said, no, that is only reserved to those who are truly judged guilty and are truly deserving of death. Barabbas had one future, crucified by noon, dead by nightfall. That his only future was the very fact that waited him was a cross and those nails and that very tomb where no one would mourn after him. Barabbas was guilty. There was no question, no doubting. There was all of the evidence there. But the fact is, is that Barabbas isn't the only one. Just look at all of the characters in all of the very rest of that story of the Gospel of John. Look at all of those people in the life of Jesus, whether they are for Him or against Him. They are all guilty of something. That every single one, whether it's denying by Peter, is that whether it is indeed betraying by Judas, whether it is Pilate who tries to wash his hands but indeed does not cleanse his sin, that whether it is those disciples who fled or the high priest in the Sanhedrin who put him on trial, that all were guilty, just like us. That Ephesians 2 says what? It says that all of us were born dead in our trespasses. It's that 2 Corinthians 4.4 says that we indeed are blinded by the very God of this world. It's that in so many ways we find ourselves unaware of just the depths of our guilt. I mean, Isaiah 64, 6, I think, indeed, deals that devastating blow to our pride, to our confidence, to our very way that we look at ourselves, is that it says that even our finest deeds are like unclean rags. I mean, just think about that. Even our nicest moments, our best things, are often so tainted by our arrogance and our pride, so tainted by our self-righteousness and our self-serving motives that God still sees the stain that is left by them. That Paul proclaims in Romans 7, as he looks at his own life, wretched man that I am, not wretched man that I was, present tense today, wretched man that I am. And that's Paul. So we find ourselves in the midst of this time, that we find ourselves looking at what the Bible must proclaim. The Bible calls a spade a spade, and he, it calls the very thing that it sees sin. Sin is not simply just that regrettable lapse. It is not just that occasional stumble, but sin is that rebellion. That rebellion that says, God, I'm going to follow my way, not your way. It's that way in which we can lay claim to God's throne or storm the heavens or defy his authority and say, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. is that in so many ways we take our life into our own hands. Yet we don't necessarily like to be called sinners, more morally challenged, right? 
that we don't like to consider ourselves guilty, more psychologically sensitive, we'll go ahead and say. Is that what do we begin to hear? Is that Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Now, what does that mean? That I'm capable of lying to me way better than I would ever be able to lie to somebody else. That I am able to convince myself that everything's okay. <laughs> when indeed we know that things have gone awry. That Isaiah 53 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. So do you have your way? that I have my way, that each of us goes astray. Your way may be accumulation and greed. Her way may be intoxication. His way may be flirtation. My way may be workaholism. Is that we all have turned our own way of either claiming our own authority or claiming our own self-righteousness that we, like Barabbas, are guilty. So we are prisoners to our past. The low road of choices and the high-minded pride that God has now declared us for who we are. That we are sinners. And He has pronounced judgment in that trial. That sin deserves death. But I want you to think about this. So we hear that innocent one of Jesus. We see that guilty one of Barabbas and ourselves. But in this account tonight, who is it that goes free? Is that who is it that is now set free to go about their life? I mean, can you imagine that conversation and that situation as Barabbas sitting there in his cell now had the guard come, unlock the door, swing it wide open, and say, you've been set free. That as he stumbled out into the light that is now there surrounding him, Shackles gone and crimes pardoned and life awaiting him. That what went through his mind? How? How could this happen? That when we think about our own lives, is that how can God even set us free? That Christ endured not just the Roman nails and the mockery and the spears, but Christ endured even the very grinding gears of God's justice that day. Is that sin? Sin cannot just be swept under the rug with that whole idea of simply, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. No, sin. Sin can't be overlooked can't be pretended away, can't be simply just kind of forgotten, that sin has a cost, and that's the very price that our Lord Jesus paid for us, that we might be free, that some have said it well, that it's accurate to say that Christ substituted Himself for the world but it is life-changing instead to say, Christ substituted Himself for me. That when we see that He is the one who stepped in, though our sins are many, God's greater grace is bigger. That what does He proclaim to us? For freedom Christ has set us free. That there are a million of million ways that we can find ourselves prisoners to sin. But there is only one way, only one path, that only one person that can set us free, and that is Jesus alone. 
the one who bore our sin, the one who indeed no law could stop, no verdict could indeed find itself more true. That as he took our place and gave us that very promise, that as he says in John 8, 36, that if the Son has set you free, that you will be free indeed. That's good news, not just for people like Barabbas, but as good news for all. That may it grant you this day and every day that peace of God that surpasses all understanding that may guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.